Jack, I wonder if first of all you could tell me, you know, what your name was, what your rank was in the Marine, and how you got to be there, just briefly. Okay, first of all, my name is Jack Hill. Uh, I started out 18 years old. I left high school as a semi drop out. I had four months before I graduated, but uh, I wasn't fairly interested in graduating. But uh, I went in the Marine Corps due to um, the uh, I wanted to experiment and experiment and uh, experience, and I liked the uh, I liked the service. I I did want to volunteer for Vietnam. I did volunteer to go to Vietnam. Why did you volunteer to go to Vietnam? Well, I won't say it was a patriotic thing to do because I, it wasn't. Because I'm, a, I'm an adventurer. I like, I, at that time, I felt that I wanted to go and see what was going on. What struck you when you, when you first got there, and who did you join up with? I mean, well, when we first got to Vietnam, I, uh, it was a massive mess. There was millions of people around, everybody, running from this place to that place. I first had a Hunch I wanted to be a machine gunner on, a, on a Huey, but that canceled out right away because you hear rumors about uh, the death rate. You know, if you got this job, you'll die quicker. If you got that job, you might live six months, but the span of life was only six months. So, I uh, we got to uh, Hotel Company, 2-1, 1st, 2nd Battalion, 1st Marines, which what? was what fairly... Is this? What, what, what period is this? What time um, did you join I yourself? got uh, Vietnam, I say, about the end of November, just be before the 1st of December. It was uh, yeah, a hot day, you know, but uh, uh, it was a lot of mass confusion. You didn't know what was going on until it took a few days to settle down. I was still, you know, wondering where the hell you were at because it was just one of those places you couldn't even recognize, you know. And uh, at the same time, it was a nice looking place, beautiful, all greenish and stuff. And, uh, but we got to the company and, uh, that same day it rained on so after that it was just orientating, you know, picking up your gear and uh, getting uh, orientated to what you had to do. First day was just total chaos. You became uh, a point man, I believe. Well, if you can tell me briefly, first of all, what a, what a point man does and what was your first mission, mission like? And if you could look at me rather than at Larry, that's... Uh, well, my... I had roamed around here for about two or three days. Guys was rotating, and we was asked to, uh, you know, pick a specific job, what we wanted to do. So, I, uh, being adventurous like I am, I uh, picked point man. I thought it was, if I had to get get it or I have to find my way around, I was pretty capable of doing that. You know, just my uh, intuition said that I could do it, so I picked the job for myself. What does a point man do? Well, mainly you get out there in front, and you sort of stick your nose out there, and you sort of look for booby traps and... Uh, Unknown things that normal people just can't see, you know, like trip wires. You got your trip wires. You got an ambush set up. You know, you got your open terrain. You got to go into and stuff like that. But mainly, it's out there fighting, making a way to uh, for the rest of the squad to get into certain areas and stuff. And uh, it's pretty hairy. What was it like being out on your first few missions? I mean, when were you first with somebody, for example, who was killed in your unit, or what was that? What did it feel like? Well, it was uh, it's a little shaky, a little scared. The first experience I had was like it was a nighttime um, booby trap went off. Uh, one of the uh, third squ uh, third squad points point men had gotten hit uh, at night, so it was like totally dark, and all you could see was a big flash of light go off, and you hear the screaming and howling. But nobody got killed on the first uh, first nighttime patrol. You're nervous. You're nervous. Very nervous. You're shaky. You want to know what's going on. You want to do the right thing, and uh, you're very nervous. You're very nervous and scared. Uh, you, uh, you're constantly, you don't know what to do until it happens. Your first firefight, you know, you're looking for all the older guys in the, in the squad to tell you what to do because you don't know nothing. In my first patrol I was out on, I got pinned down for about 15 seconds so we had a machine gunner come up there and he got me out of it and then uh, we returned fire and uh, we set up a little um, uh, sweep took us about most of the day to get into the village and uh, we got in there, we didn't take no casualties, we didn't take no prisoners, we didn't take nothing. It's just hit and run type thing they pull on you. They, they snipe at you and then you, they pin you down for 10, 20 minutes, next thing you know they're gone. What did you actually think about the Vietnamese? Did People? you have any thoughts about the Vietnamese? Uh, yeah, I thought they were uh, fairly friendly people. 
the ones that I've encountered. You know, I mean, gorillas is a different thing from human beings, but the Vietnamese people themselves, I found fairly friendly people. Okay, I'd like to to move on, Jack. As I, as I was telling you, we've been in Vietnam, and we were taken to a village called Tuibo, uh, and our research indicates that the company that went into Tuibo uh, on that day, January the 31st, was Hotel Company. Uh, you're in Hotel Company. I wonder if you can think back to the end of 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 January, I believe there were some incidents before. We've had fair information on that. The first two days, I believe, were very tough uh, fighting, and quite a few men um, sure. were lost. My interest is really in on on the third day when I believe a Lieutenant Connor uh, was killed. Um, I wonder if you could set me up just briefly about the first two days, and then move on to the third. Well, I could say, like, normally you come through on the village, and the operation you come through on is sweeping motion online, and you're sweeping through the village. So we get up to this village, and uh, first you start off with a little light sniper fire, you know, then then you get this 50 calibers opened up, and you're getting 30 calibers opened up, and uh, you're getting people falling all over, so you're, you're, you're running around trying to find out what you're doing. So we spread out and dug in, waiting for the word to, uh, to advance, but there was no advance. We was pinned down, and we were pinned down all day all night in the rain. It rained like something pitiful. You couldn't see nothing. You couldn't see nothing. You were just pinned out there. And uh, we had casualties. We took on a lot of casualties. And um, uh, just laying out there hearing you, hearing your partners uh, crying that they was hit. We had uh, one PFC Dumas, I think, he got killed on that operation for sure. And uh, I seen his um, squad leader, Hall, get up and run out there towards him because we was on a sweep in motion like this here, and Dumas was out at this position like this here, and our squad was coming up on this side, and uh, he gotten hit, and his squad leader jumped up out there, and he ran out there to, to aid him and stuff. Then he got hit with a 50 caliber, but it only glanced off his flight jacket, and he got hit in the leg, and uh, he crawled the rest of the way out there, and he stayed out there all day with him. My squad leader, uh, Corporal Munez, he got hit point blank with a 50 caliber. He laid out there and died. He used to lay around waiting, waiting to, watching your partners die. That's what we did. For two days? For two days. What? You say, I mean, it, it conjures up horrific scene. Tell, tell me more about it. What sort of things were said? What did it sound like? Oh, well, it was intense gunfire, and it sounded like a jackhammer. If you ever hear a jackhammer going off, it sounded like you had about 10, 15 jackhammers going off at the same time. I mean, total chaos. There was hardly... Little return fire we we could get off was 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 barely enough to do any damage at all. So you know you lay down and you shoot with your hand up over your head and you wait another ten or fifteen minutes to see if it's safe enough to shoot. If not, you just lay there, just lay and wait. You try to maneuver for positions, you know, and uh, see if you could get in that village. But we could not get in that village. There was no way, and we wasn't fighting ourselves. We hardly wasn't fighting ourselves. We watched guys. I'd watch the guys lay there and cry for their mothers all night long. Dying, slowly dying, asking to be shot because you can't take it no more. And you're sitting up there with your, with your bundle of nerves, your bundle of nerves, and all you can do is wait, 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 and we waited. So yeah. uh, it lightened, lightened up, and then uh, we advanced towards the village. We got in that village. There was, there was no cartridge shells left around. There were, there were no. There were no signs of no VC enemy at all. They had old women, old, old men, babies, you know. And uh, it was mass chaos. Like I say, everybody's running around screaming. We got in the village and they're asking where the VC were, and people in the village were saying no VC. And like at one end of the village, you could hear uh, machine gun fire going off and people screaming, you know. And you know that somebody was either down in one of them holes getting dug out of there or something. And uh, we dropped plenty of hand grenades down in, in booby traps, I mean, in, in holes and stuff to uh, to see if we could root them out. You, know, you go into a hooch and you got uh, you got tunnels in there and uh, you got old ladies and kids in there running out. And uh, we didn't, uh, I didn't shoot any old ladies and kids. I don't, I know half the guys in my squad didn't shoot no old ladies and kids because it's, it just, that wasn't the fight there. You know, they probably got shot, some of them probably got shot or killed as we advanced towards that village. Are you shooting from 100 yards away and whatever, to whom it may concern, that's it, you don't know. 
So you actually yourself went into the village yourself. I gather there was two 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 platoons were blocking, and one one platoon actually went in. Going yes. into search. So you search. were you were in on the search. You were in on the search. search. Uh, you, could you could you go through that again? You, you say all sort okay. of mayhem. Could will... you tell me? I wonder were you close to example where um, Connors was killed? Were you around there? Can you remember that? Can you remember any orders being given or? Well, I think we uh, just set up our regular 360 perimeter after you got hit and stuff to see if we can get a medevac in because we had several medevac uh, people we were trying to get out. So uh, basically, you know, you got a corpsman up, checking him out, and, uh, and if he's DOA, that's it. You just cover him up, and he lays there, and you stack all the bodies up that you can, and you try to get him out of there on the first uh, medevac coming in after that. Okay, I'm going to stop, and I think we're running out, are we? Jack, I'd like you to sink back again to that day. It's the third day. I wonder if you can uh, describe to me the, the, the first casualty on that day and, and the orders and what happened. Well, we had already had casualties the night before. I think we had casualties for almost the first day we got there. So the casualty list was already up. Uh, third day we had casualties. We took in casualties. I don't know when the, when the word that uh, the captain had gotten hit, but... Uh, he gotten hit, you know, and we was waiting to uh, for further word on an evacuation. So uh, there was a mass confusion on getting our. You got to get your dead and wounded to a certain spot and have it set up, and then you set up your 360 for that to come in. But the main thing we was concerned about is our security. You, you know, you have to uh, with that type of action. Everybody was worried about their own security and, and what was going to take place in that next event. You know, the captain was already dead, and there was nothing you could do. We, we didn't take no prisoners. We didn't. Uh, we didn't take nothing but a whole lot of flak. We got a whole lot of uh, wounded and KIAs that day on our side. On their side, we uh, we didn't re report no KIAs on their side because like it was mass confusion when we got in that village. I mean, guys on our side were just uh, concerned with their own safety. And like I say, when you go through that hoochie, one of those one of those hooches, you're gonna. You're gonna give it. You're gonna give it to them, and whoever was in that hole or whoever was around there, when uh, when you're spread out like that, there you are. They're gonna get it. The guy's attitude. Our attitude was very uh, was very poor because we uh, we took a lot of KIAs that day. With a lot of friends, we lost a lot of friends. Our emotions were were very low, you know, because the uh, the death rate was ridiculous for what we figured was a friendly village. So the orders was uh Search and destroy. That was what, what the last order was. We we're going to search and destroy, and that's what uh, that's the way it went down. Been speaking to um, some of your buddies from that period, and a lot of what you say has similar evocations. For they they come up with similar things. One thing that um, they do say is exactly as you say that guys were very up very upset, very angry. But I wonder, can you remember what the actual order was? Can you remember Captain Banks or anybody in command of you giving a specific order as to what was to be done in that village? Can you remember anything? Uh, yeah. The last order was came down from uh, squad leader to squad leader was we were going to search and destroy, and after we do, we're pulling out. Hmm. That's the way it went. Search and destroy as you go in there and... Uh, Whatever was moving around, wasn't going to move no more. And that was the general attitude. It was like that daily. That was a daily thing. If it was called search and destroy, that's what we went in there and done. Mainly, like, not a lot of women and children. We didn't, it wasn't uh, to say it was mass murder type. Like, like I say, you get in the way of uh, M14 or M60 caliber machine gun, there's no telling who's going to get killed. And you got an angry 18-year-old kid behind a gun, and he just seen his buddy get killed. He's not going to have no remorse of who's on the receiving end of that 60 caliber machine gun. And at that time, we our attitude was just, to, hey, we're getting the hell out of here in a hurry as soon as we get the order to pull out. That's what we've done. We got the order to pull out. We set up our uh, our uh, 360 to get out of there. We got our dead and wounded out of there. And uh, on the way out of that village, we caught the holy hell again. They dogged us for almost 100 yards back out of that same village that we just went into. 
I was told by one guy but that he went in as far as he was concerned was the order is, and I, there's a quote here, and I don't know whether you agree with it or not, the order is to kill everybody. Yes. Then we started killing everybody. Would that be similar to your recollection of that day? Yeah. But everybody didn't get killed. Some, I mean, they got, there were some got shot. There's people that shot. But everybody didn't get killed that day. Because you just flat out refused to do that. I mean, you wouldn't refuse to do it, but you just wouldn't, you just wouldn't do it. You know, there was no need to, to kill an innocent woman and her baby. There was no need for that, you know. Some guys had to feel them do that, but hey, that's the way it went down. One of the other people we were speaking to saying that there, a lot of the people weren't running around, that they were actually in their hooches, and they were there, right? and that they were in fact still still killed, and in fact somebody else, and this is, I'm giving you all quotes from Americans now, I'm not speaking about right. what the Vietnamese have to say. Another American guy said that um, some of the members of the company were, quote, acting like barbarians and were actually killing people in the hooches. Do you think that could conceivably have gone on? Did you see, first of all? Tell me what you saw only, not... Uh, from what I've seen, I see my team, uh, we was mainly pull security. We was the first team in. We, we, un we unloaded a, several rounds. We dropped a couple of grenades in the, in the hooches to get the people out because to get one of the Vietnamese out of that hole, they won't come. I mean, you and we didn't speak perfect Vietnamese, so... Uh, in order to get them out of there, you either cranked off a couple of rounds or you drop your M26 grenade down there. And they get the message and they come on out of there. You know, if they got wounded, if they got hit, that was, that was the part of war. It's something you have to live with. Is there anything that sticks in your mind of that operation which either worried you or that you saw going on? I mean, was it a typical operation or was it an untypical operation? Well, to my recollection, yeah, it was typical. Something we done every day. Not the killing part. No, I mean, we don't. Uh, a normal operation, you're gonna take a lot of a lot of people gonna get killed. But it's on a, on a regular search mission like what we had came down with, the order was that they had uh, VC troops in that area. And then, and and from the fact they said it was a friendly uh, village, and you go in with the with your guard down thing. It's a friendly village, and 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 you encounter the enemy for so long, you uh, your attitude changes. So. That day, it was not, it was just like any other operation that you had to you had to do it. You know, you had to do it. Something you had to do. This is a, a direct question. Did you yourself see any men killing Civilians? women and children? No, not often. No, to be honest, not often. None of my team. I didn't see none of my team. How many men in your particular team? No, oh, we had about. After squad leader got killed, we had about seven. So did you basically go quickly through the village, or did you do a holding operation? Did you wait outside, or what? How long were you actually in the centre of the village? Oh, we was in, a good, in the village for a good hour or two. We was in there for, for a long while. You have to get, sort of maintain some sort of control to find out who's, who is what, you know. And there was nobody who's what, and you know, you got no commander. Your company commander just got hit. And you're looking for somebody else to give a direct order, and you either got a staff sergeant out there, or you got a corporal out there that knows what's going on, and you wait. I was only a PFC, so uh, my job was just to set up my security and make sure that uh, my sector was taken care of, you know, and put up that security because you had to do it. You, you either end up with your back turned and getting shot. So you know, it was like uh, you're running that village, and anybody in there, you tell them, "Lot, I get out." You know, and they get out and you circle everybody up there and uh, you, you go through this questioning thing, you know. And then they say, yo, first team out, and you know, you, I'm the point man. And they said, pull out, you pull out. I get out of there, I pull out, I'm up with my gun and I'm up front, never looking back. You don't know what's, you know, and there was still fire and there was firing going on. Like the village, it was, there was gunfire going all over that village. The whole village was, was just in the chaos of, of fire after we got in there. Those guys just getting there, their stuff off. You know, you, you, there's nothing you can do about it. What happens in uh, in that situation normally, and indeed what happened on that particular day? So you go in, uh, you do some quick questioning or you're searching. Now, on that particular day, what happened? You go into the village, 
You've explained there was a lot of a lot of fighting, and you throw a grenade uh, down if you see there's a tunnel. But were the prisoners taken that day? Do you no, know there's no prisoners. There was there was no nothing. There was no nothing after after um, the uh, command was to, to search and destroy. That was it. There was there was there was a lot of people left alive around that village. There was a lot. You know, you do what you got to do, and you pull out. We called in, and they told us to pull out of that area. We got the, we got the word to pull out. We was in there a couple of hours trying to maintain uh, what had happened. It was, you know, you try to maintain law and order, and uh, there was none. There was nobody in charge of that village. There was no village chief that you could come and ask, you know, what's going on in here? Why uh, take our men three days to get in here, and, and uh, you people want our help in this area, saying that they got Viet Cong in there, and we're in here to protect you, and we end up fighting this same village that we come here to uh, protect. So we got the order to move in, move out, and that's what it, that's what happens. It just was like every day. So as far as you're concerned, uh, your recollection of that day when you left the village was had all the village itself been destroyed? No, I wasn't totally destroyed. It was it was burning. It was you know dead and wounded around there and stuff. Had A lot it? of burning and stuff. A lot of burning, burning down the hooches and stuff. It's the only way. That's what we done every day. It's the only way you can uh, dig them out. They wasn't coming out of there like uh, like your host greeting you at the door. Nothing like that at all. They just was buried in there. Old ladies. I mean, men that were ancient, look ninety something years old. You couldn't you couldn't invite them out with a with a with a free meal. So I mean, you, you know, you, you you get tired of uh, going through the same routine hour after hour, minute after minute, and you're scared yourself about you're going to get shot in the back because one of these little kids will come up and shoot you. We had many days where we had uh, girls, little girls run up with a basket of chickens and stuff, and their chickens would be booby-trapped. Sorry, okay, just a minute. We're doing well. <laughs> Jack, go back to this um, this day yet again. There's just a couple more things I'd like to uh, mention which have come up uh, from our research over here. These, these are Americans we've been speaking to. I've told you that the allegations that some people weren't running around, that they were just in, the, in their village. One of the other things that was mentioned, and I wonder whether you could recollect anything like this happening, is that one guy talks of women and children being pushed into a bunker and then a grenade being thrown in on top of them to deal with them. Is it conceivable that anything like that could have gone on? Did you see anything like that go on? Could have went on, could have went on. I really don't know. I wasn't safe to say at one end of the village and, and was aware of, you know, things going on. There was a lot of screaming and going on, a lot of ladies and old people and uh, kids crying. You know, it was a mass confusion. And uh, to say for sure, if I seen it, I couldn't. I couldn't really verify it. Mm -hmm. Is there any? Just to let you sort of dwell on this, whilst I look through my papers a minute, is there anything that photographically sticks uh, in your mind that you saw specifically that you thought, "My, I wish that wasn't so," or "I wish that hadn't happened," or was there anything that day? Yeah, no, not that day. No. The things I uh, try to put away is seeing my partners getting killed. Laying out there in that uh, in that mud and that rain for so long. That's the only thing that really upset me about that whole uh, operation. I could have given a damn about what happened inside that village. It's my personal feelings. More about um, about that. We were talking about that earlier, and you touched on it. And I think it was obviously quite sort of. Yeah, Can well, you remember specifically what they were what they were saying as they were calling to you to help you, saying that some of your buddies were asking just to be killed or to yeah, be finished? Well, that's the thing you got to listen. You listen to that, and uh, it's the agony there. You know, you got your buddies crying for their mothers. You know, mama, mama, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Please help me, and daddy, and you know, personal things that you you can't do nothing about, and you're set at two to three yards away, and you can't even get up and do anything about it because you're pinned down. You're pinned down. You can't do nothing but sit there and listen to it and uh, bug right up. And that's the, was the painfulest thing about that whole three-day operation. Did you use and lose anybody very close to you, or was it just buddies in the company? Well, it was. Well, I consider at that time I consider everybody was real close. Like I said, the other uh, squad point man there, we were 
we were sort of proud of ourselves because we had come over on the same plane. We got to be in the same company, and uh, he was a point man for uh, first squad, and I was a point man for second squad. So we were we was kind of you know proud of ourselves as, as being you know as being buddies and stuff. So we kind of you know looked after each other and uh, talked over a little strategy of what we use different as being as far as point men would do, you know, and uh, the day he got killed was just, you know, terribly excited, upsetting to me, period. And my squad leader, which I said, got killed, and uh, we had to sit out there with him for two days. And uh, all you could hear was him was, was crying and, and in agony about, uh, you know, and just suffering, plain suffering. There was nothing you could do about it. And that's, that's the, the worst thing I ever seen. When was it? Was it a happy... As Corny word to use, maybe, but was it a was it a, a happy company, how cold company? Were you yeah, proud we were, of yourself? Yeah, Tell me we something were, about it. But we were new. We had just gotten there. Like like I said, a couple of people that were with me on that particular operation. We had just gotten there, and uh, we was all sort of eager to to do a good job and uh, and uh, gain the respect as of being Marines. You know, and uh, we kind of looked after each other because, like I said, we came out of boot camp and uh, we was on that on that first team there, and we got real close because the old guys that were rotating, uh, they had their time, and we was trying to uh, set a pattern for our own selves to uh, do good. And uh, everybody got along good, you know. Like I said, we called the peons because we were we like a family. You got. 20 guys sleeping in the, in the same tent, and you're going to get real close. You know you know their mothers, you know their sisters, you know their brothers, you know their little personal things, you know, and uh, when you see that guy laying there, and, and there's just nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do. Okay, let's just stop a minute. Come on, please stop a minute. Jack, as I said, this is, this is one of our interviews in Vietnam, and uh, it's by someone who'd say they were, they were 10 years old and in fourth grade school at, at the time. And uh, he says that when the American infantry swept into house, they went into his house. There had been artillery shells before that. Uh, we were only women and children. We didn't we didn't know the VC. This was because we were women and children, etc. Mm. They approached us, and before they could reach us, frightening things happened. For example, they shot ears off of some people. When these people climbed up to the bed, they shot at these people, causing their guts to burst all over the place. In fact, the whole body shattered from the knees up. They came and asked us about the VC. We said we didn't know what the VC was, so they shot at us. They shot at all of us. After they shot at us, they burnt down the house. Even the domestic animals were killed. Another really brutal thing they did, it was so brutal that no human being could ever have done it, was that after killing these women and children, they stomped on the heads of one of them not yet a month old. Another thing was that there were women recovering from childbirth who were dragged out of the house and roughed up. The really terrifying thing was that after they shot and killed these people, they scattered something over them. And the, the translation says powdered gasoline, but I think they're talking about Willie Peter grenades, I think. Another thing was they threw the corpses into a burning haystacks. It was such terrifying things that if you believed in ghosts and demons, you'd be really scared. There were dead people lying all around, their guts strewn all over the place, their limbs severed. Guts and things flying as high as the ceiling. It was terrifying. It was not really human. In my family at that time, 40 persons were killed. Total number of inhabitants in Tuibo killed at that time was 105 persons. It was really terrifying. I myself was in the middle portion. This horrifying seared everyone who was alive, but the Americans just carried on. They began shooting to places the water basin nearby. They fired at us continually. I cannot tell you, I just cannot describe it. I got and fell to the ground. There were a number of bodies, dead bodies piled on top of me. For that reason, I escaped death. And eventually I got out and, and ran away from out a pile of corpses. Just, what does that say to you? Well, I say that's a, a dream from a little kid. If he was four years old, 11 years old, uh, yeah, it was terrifying. It was definitely terrifying because it was terrifying to me as far as... Uh, Cutting off ears and stomping and all that uh, massive type of uh, abusive towards uh, the people there. I don't. Uh, I really can't say. I know that the Marines went in there and we done a we done a dog down job that third day. It was. It's nothing else that can be said. We just uh, done a good job. Because that's that's the only thing that's going on. You can't. Uh, I can't evaluate on that because. Uh, 
it was a daily thing, not daily ritual to kill, but it was a daily uh, thing to search and destroy. And that, that's what your mission consists of. It took three days to get in that village. And if there was no, if there was no VC in that village, then there wouldn't have been no resistance. There would have never been no uh, casualties in that village at all if there was no VC there. And if, he, and if his family was that large, then uh, who was we fighting? His family? I can't understand. I don't understand. Uh, I don't even understand that accusation at all. You know, if we come here, uh, if you come into, a, like I say, a friendly village, then that's what you should get. You should get no resistance, none whatsoever. We've been on, on, uh, on uh, uh, I forgot the term we used, uh, to, uh, where you go in the village and you aid the, the, the uh, people, you know, you give them all this first aid and stuff, and we never got no uh, sniper fire. But here is a friendly village reported with VC. Well, it was reported that there were VC in that area. If that village was friendly, then uh, we should have never had no resistance for three days. The mass murder that uh, this young kid said happened. Probably in his eyes, from a kid's point of view, probably did. He probably seen it. You know. But uh, like I said, we done a dog down job that third day, and uh, it wasn't nothing unusual about burning them hooches down and digging them uh, Vietnamese people out of that out of them holes and uh, scattering a animals, pigs and chickens around like we normally do. That's just a normal procedure we do, especially after three days. Three days of blood and guts and in, in, in the mud. Hey. You can't take it. We couldn't take it. And uh, like that said, I can't account for every Marine that was there, what they'd done at, uh, at that particular time. They'd done it because uh, they felt that uh, that's what they had to do. I can't account for how they acted, you know. Everybody's got their own way. But if you've seen it that way, uh, it's the way you see it. The way I seen it was, uh, was uh, it was war. It was actually war. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't no <laughs> It wasn't no friendly thing. There was nothing uh, nice about that whole trip, even on their side. Uh, I'm sorry that the Vietnamese people got killed, like like it was said, but uh, we had lost as many people as they did. They got any casualty reports on us? You know, so we're, I think we came out fairly even. Do you think people don't understand what it was actually like? Or is there something that you'd want to, to say that you haven't said so far about what it was actually like? to be on those sort of missions. Do you think it affected you or changed you in any way? Sure it did. Tell the value me. of life, the value of living, the value of my life was, was on the line at that particular time. And uh, I had to, to uh, dig real, way down deep inside myself to find out uh, how I was going to survive in, in this country. You know, it wasn't nothing like I could have got out of a textbook to say, well, if I do this right, I'm guaranteed life. It wasn't something that uh, you had to dig up for yourself. And, uh, and get really serious about living. Very good. Just one more thing. Jack, I mean, I laid sort of pretty clear to you both the allegations that Vietnamese have made and various things that have been said. Um, I wonder whether there's anything more that you feel that you can add about actually going into a village and doing these sort of operations and what it did to you and what you felt about doing it or how it actually was to do it. Is there anything you want to say about it? Well, like our normal everyday procedures were like, you see, you got to take it back. So you, you walk very slow. It's a lot of taking your time and being very careful. If you're in a village from the back, from the side or out of the rice paddy, you got to do everything real slow. You know, you set up like a, a small perimeter. If you got no incoming rounds or something like that there, then you search every hooch very slow. You got to be slow because they definitely set up booby traps. They set up booby traps around the village. They set up punji stakes. They set up all sorts of little devices that you would never know. They set up snakes in their tunnels. They set up, uh, they set up uh, piles of uh, buffalo droppings and stuff. And you step in that, boom, they booby trap chairs. You can't. You can't touch nothing. You can't go through a gate without uh, using a grappling hook uh, or just taking your grenade and rolling it up there and blowing the whole gate apart and making sure there's no booby traps up there because if you mess up, that's it. That's, that's, that's the ball game. And uh, entering a village, you have, to, uh, you have to be very careful. And uh, you got you to, gotta, either if you got a uh, Chew Hawaii witch or somebody that can interpret the, the uh, Vietnamese language, then uh, 
your squad leader goes in there and he sets his men up each place where they got to be and while they do the uh, investigation and, and, and stuff like that there. But you're on your guard all the time. We had several incidents, which, like I said earlier, we had kids come up to us with booby trap uh, chickens, with, uh, with uh, crushed glass and battery acid and sodas and uh, all sorts of little weird stuff they, they'll pull on you. And they definitely will catch you. Even if they take one away, it doesn't matter to them. So on an everyday patrol or on a, on a sweep or a search and destroy mission, you, uh, you must take your time. Just tell me, I mean, did you basically, how did you, st did you see the kids and women as kids and women or did you see them as enemy who are quite likely to, I mean, what was your, what was your attitude? I see them as kids and women with, uh, with the attitude that they, they'll, they'll get you. There was no, uh, you couldn't, you could say you wanted to trust them, but you couldn't trust them. So you was always on your guard to uh, be alert. You wanted to be friendly because there's no, there's no man that I know on this earth would just stand there point blank and shoot a little kid without no feelings, or shoot a lady without no feelings. And uh, to get that, you, you'd have to be very careful. You can't, uh, you can't turn your backs on them. They will definitely snipe you. An old man will snipe you. A young kid will snipe you. The, the ladies, they'll snipe you. There's not, there, was, there was no trust in them. You know, no trust in them at all. You'd uh, stayed on your guard. Was it the sort of war you expected? No. What was different about it? Well, the uh, like I said, we call it searching. You got it. You, you constantly had to look for them. You could never find them. We could never see them. You could, you could never put your hands on them. You know, they'd lead you into an ambush, and and all you could catch was gunfire. Twenty minutes later, you know, and uh, you go in there where you got the gunfire, and you might have one or two dead via v v VC. But other than that, you couldn't. Half the time, you we didn't know who was fighting. You couldn't see nobody. We get caught out in the open rice paddy dike, and uh, I mean a rice paddy, and you'd, you'd, you'd be hung up out there unless you got lucky in uh, calling the airstrike or something like that, or had your mortars with you, and you drop a couple more around seventy-nine rounds in there and take a hooch out. You know, then you got to go in there and be careful to search that hooch on the on the thing. They want you to uh, report all the dead and the wounds you got. You'd have to go and get the dead and report them at that particular time. And that was one of our major things we had to do. You know, it was uh, you was uncareful you. You'd wind up in a plastic bag. Okay, I've already got a couple, couple more questions now. The my reading of what the Vietnamese have to say, and certainly the way they they speak over there, is that they regard this whole incident as a virtually a a massacre of of a village. Uh, that's how it appears in their their history books and on their war memorials. I mean, what do you do? You have anything to add to that? Do you do? You, I mean, is there anything that you'd like to like to say about that? I suppose really, I'm putting all my mm. questions in together. The charges yeah. are that you and your buddies went in and 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 massacred a village. I wonder whether you've got anything that you'd like to say that I haven't asked you that you'd like to add to that. No, well, if that's, I'm going to speak on behalf of my buddies that were there and. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the uh, dead ones and the ones that are alive now will definitely agree with me. We had uh, no intention to go in there with the mass murder on our mind. That was definitely out of the picture because we were too young at that time to even realize how we was going to go in there and, and present ourselves towards the situation. So you never had that in mind ab about committing mass murder. All right, the ordeal that went down, it was mass murder on our side. You know, like I said before, we had a lot of casualties taken. My, I, I felt that the Vietnamese people themselves threatened my life as we was trying to pull police action. And the allegations that uh, it was mass murder, no, I definitely have to agree, disagree with that. I definitely disagree with that. And I'm pretty sure that everybody else say, hey, we had to do a job. It was a job that you had to do because we wasn't coming out that village alive. We didn't, we wasn't, there was no way. We got ran out of there. We got ran almost five miles back out of that same village that they say we massacred. And if we massacred that village and there was no people left alive, then who ran us out of there? We're still wondering right now who ran us out of there. We ran five miles dropping water cans, supplies, ammunition, everything that we could drop to get back out of that same village. Took us three days to get in. So I, uh, I definitely have to say no, we didn't go in there with... Uh, with the intent of committing mass murder. Okay, I mean, I think I'm through, unless there's anything that you would like to add or 
have to say or is there anything you think I haven't asked you that I shouldn't have should have asked you or that you feel hey what about this or have I been I yeah can't... well you could uh, sort of like you know like my personal feelings uh, as far as going to Vietnam I, I definitely wanted to go as a soldier and as a as an American citizen to uh, participate in uh, in my uh, service abilities as far as joining the service but uh, I learned a lot from Vietnam myself personally about uh, how the American system works out and works for uh, disabled veterans and veterans alone that uh, have suffered under this war. I have uh, stress. I'm, you know, personally, I have. Uh, I don't think I've recovered uh, mentally as to uh, to say um, I'm back to normal. I'm not back to normal. I'm far from being back to normal. I, uh, you know, I'm still, I'm still. Under, I have a lot of stressed thoughts about uh, it's not over yet. You know, I was still, you know, like they say, is it a dream or is it memorex or what? But I still, in my sleep, see these things going on every night. You know, I, have, you know, I'm still, uh, still a little shaky over it. I haven't begun to settle down yet. You know, and it's, uh, it's a bad thing that happened. Okay, that's fine. Let's cut it there. Very good.